Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We're physicians and professors at Yale University, and we're trying to get closer to the truth about health and healthcare. This is a very special episode of the podcast today, Harlan. Do you know why? Is your mom coming on? My mom is not coming on, although that would be very special. <laughs> no, in well, fact. What do we have today? What do we have today? In fact, it is our 100th episode, and we have a very oh, special wow. guest. President Peter Salve is Yale's 23rd president and the Chris Argyris Professor of Psychology. At the beginning of this academic year, President Salovey announced that he will step down as president, a position he has held for over a decade. During his extensive Yale career, President Salovey has also served as provost, dean of Yale College, dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and as chair of the Department of Psychology. In addition to his institutional leadership, which has included numerous accomplishments, such as launching the Jackson School of Global Affairs and transitioning the Yale School of Public Health into an independent school, President Salovey was an early pioneer of the theory of emotional intelligence and is published extensively with a focus on the connections among emotion, health communication, and health behavior. He received a BA in psychology and an MA in sociology from Stanford before coming to Yale, where he has been ever since. He earned a master's degree and a PhD in psychology before joining our faculty in 1986. I want to first welcome you, and I'm going to jump right in and ask you the big question, and that is, this is a healthcare podcast. We do this jointly with the School of Management and the School of Public Health. And this is a very big year for our School of Public Health. And you have been instrumental in allowing the School of Public Health to be a fully independent school. I'd love to hear about how your history at Yale has informed your ability to do something that other deans had told me would be impossible. <laughs> well, thank you, first of all, Harlan, Howie. Uh, appreciate the invitation to come on your podcast and uh it's great to see you both, although I was hoping to see your mother, but um, <laughs> uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and to celebrate the 100th podcast uh, uh, with you. So I think the question was, um, uh, how are we, why are we taking the School of Public Health uh, independent? I think to attract the very best faculty, either as faculty with secondary appointments uh, who might be elsewhere in the university, uh, but especially primary faculty in the School of Public Health, they expect the public health school to be self-governing, setting its own curriculum, setting, having its own uh, uh, standards for promotion and tenure and uh, who it wants to hire and, and the like. And so uh, I think it makes it a more attractive school for um, accomplishing my goal, which is that it should be among the very, very best schools of public health uh, in the world today. I think when I talk about a more unified Yale, it's one in which disciplinary boundaries don't get in the way of our doing our, our very best work. Well, I mean, uh, there are a couple of things, Peter. First of all, you know, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you. You know, th these years of service, these have been great years for Yale. And the point that you make about this is, I think, emblematic of what Yale is. Really, there are no boundaries. I mean, people are, it's a very nice community. People can collaborate across disciplines. I wanted to ask you, you know, in talking about the school public, you and I had the opportunity to participate together. You actually were leading this effort. Remember 20 years ago when we sort of looked at whether or not school public health should become independent, and we sort of were weighing these, these issues, and it, it sort of seems sweet to me that at, at sort of the end of your term, you're able to actually realize this vision of an independent school public health. But for people who are listening, you sort of are starting to get at this, but but what's the real meaning of that? I mean, for a school of public health, you know, is it that you, you know, by the way, great job recruiting Megan Rainey, a, a, a terrific superstar, you know, to be the first an inaugural dean of an independent school. But, but what, what are the real advantages as we go out into the world and say, it's a new day for public health at Yale because of what we've just done? What is it, what is it that makes it a new day? Yeah, I think, uh, I think a few things. Uh, one is, first of all, just the symbolic value of focusing on public health, saying it deserves status as one of our professional schools. But more important than that symbolic value is, uh, I would say, two pragmatic concerns. One is self-governance. So public health should be able uh, to set its own curriculum for its MPH and its PhD students. Public health should be able to choose its own faculty, should be able to decide on its own criteria for 
promotion for tenure should decide on what its own strategic priorities are. With close ties all over the university and with an openness to listening to what others say all over the university, but ultimately with its own authority to make those decisions. I also think the last issue is financial. Public health should be able to make its own financial trade-offs. What we did to make the school independent, the first step was to put it in budget equilibrium. That is, it has the financial resources to pay its own bills. Its financial robustness rises and falls with the university's endowment and the university's overall budget, but it has its own, but it works on the same model as everyone else. Um, That allows the public health school to make trade-offs. It also allows the public health school to benefit when the endowment does better than our budget models suggest it should. Uh, It also allows the public health school to benefit directly from its own, the generosity of its own alumni and friends. And it's not lost on those alumni and friends that an independent public health school is a more attractive target. Yeah, by the way, I'm hoping that 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 our alumni will see this as an immense opportunity to invest in what's going to be the leading school of public health in the nation as it starts to grow out from what what seeds you've planted now. I mean, and by the way, an illustrious history, let's not neglect that. But but now with this independence, it's a new day for public health at Yale, I believe. Yeah, exactly. A A new day. And what's interesting is uh, we're going to be a a very top public health school in part because the independence makes it easier in a way to collaborate across boundaries. Yeah, yes, yes. Right, because you're collaborating on equal footing. And I want to come back to something that you've said, but that to me is very obvious, and that is that many of our schools at Yale are extremely interconnected in ways that other institutions are not. So I think about the School of Management's connection with the Forestry School and the School of Public Health and the Law School and the Law School's relationship with the School of Public Health, and obviously the Medical School's connection to the Nursing School and the School of yeah, Medicine. Even, even public, public Health has joint programming with the School of the Environment around environmental exactly. health. Exactly. And, uh, just as an example, it's it's all over the place, and, and, you know, so, I, I say law and management in particular. And so as yeah. president, you know, I think people may not even understand what the role is of president. There's also a provost below. But as president, how are you able to foster those areas of interconnection so that the greater Yale benefits from the, these types of programs? Yeah, you know, it, it, so it, it, my first day, it wasn't even my first day as president. It was the day I was announced to be president, which was about six months before I became president. Um, I said Yale needed to be more unified. Yale needed to be more accessible. Yale needed to be more innovative. And all of that would make us that much more excellent. Um, so part of what a president does is try to set a vision uh, around which lots of ideas can flow. But there's a couple of other things we can do, again, uh, on the ground. One of them is try to put people together. So look at what is happening next door to the School of Public Health at 100 College Street. We have a couple floors there occupied by the psychology department. In fact, my faculty office is there. Yeah, I noticed you gave them the top floor. You gave them the top. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. They have the top. Below them is uh, is the neuroscience department from the medical school. Right. In between is a new multidisciplinary institute called the Wutsai Institute studying human cognition. And then there's shared equipment in the building that everybody is using. Right? So one of the things you can do is through, through collocation, make it easy to collaborate. Right? You don't have to walk, walk across campus or even open up a Zoom call. You can simply walk down the hall or down a flight of stairs and, and collaborate. I think the other thing that fosters collaboration in addition to people just running into each other, which I think is super important. Uh, by the way, that, that building also has a cafeteria and a coffee shop and a gym. And to, don't think that isn't about getting people yeah. to <laughs> get to know each other uh, across uh, disciplinary boundaries as well. But the, uh, in addition to that, uh, those physical spaces, uh, you can create resources that are available when people collaborate across boundaries. So special seed grants, Uh, special innovation grants, special support for working together on proposals that go outside the university. When I was starting out my career as a professor, 
I, you know, I was an assistant professor in the psychology department. I didn't have any joint appointments at that time. I was doing work uh, on emotional intelligence, as you mentioned, but I was also doing work on how people think about health and illness and conceptualize it. That was moving me into how we communicate about health and illness and moving me toward how to help health messaging become more persuasive and more motivating and what's its connection with actual health behavior. And I discovered that um, there were people in the School of Public Health with similar interests. But how did I discover that? I discovered it because the university brought us together to work on a grant proposal together around uh, cancer prevention. And they asked me, could, you know, we don't have enough behavioral science in this grant proposal. Could you, with your psychological perspective, think about the questions you like to ask, but with a cancer outcome? Wow. With, with behavior relevant to cancer prevention. And then later, same kind of thing happened around HIV AIDS. And so I, I developed these networks of people who thought about cancer prevention and this network of people who thought about HIV AIDS prevention uh, and treatment, all because we were pulled together to work on proposals together ultimately and then uh, be part of it. Those Both of those proposals were successful and we ended up having centers that really broke down the barriers among among disciplines. You know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was your thoughts about medical schools and, and the way in which they fit within to universities. Over the last 50 years, you know, there, there has been an asymmetry of growth within major universities because of the influx of NIH funding and the, the sort of largest of, of clinical care revenues, honestly, that have led to budgets on medical school sides that can rival what is happening almost on the rest of the campus and in enlarging faculties to, to a point where they're almost half the faculty could be considered to be part of the medical schools. In some places like Harvard, the, the, the hospitals themselves actually became employers of the doctors and they became, they got affiliations with the medical school at Yale. And I think this is a great advantage at Yale. We we're full fledged members of the faculty, but does this keep a president up at night sometimes because you know, there, you know, there is some risk uh, because of the way that health policy goes and in the way in which NIH goes that, that can really affect funds flow and revenue streams. And you've got all these committed, you know, the funds committed to faculty. And anyway, I just wondered, does that enter your thinking at all? Or does it in terms of strategically what the future of this is going to look like? So sure, you know, it, it's something we do talk about a lot. We have uh, our trustees have a medical school committee that uh, thinks about uh, risk and, uh, uh, you know, as well as uh, the rewards of having yeah, rewards. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> well, what you describe is happening at Yale. The, the university has a five billion dollar budget as a whole, and almost 50 percent of that budget is the Yale School of Medicine. And 50 percent is everything else. Mm. Uh, and uh, what has really changed in the last decade uh, is clinical revenue. So uh, revenue from research used to be the leading uh, source of revenue for the medical school and, and, and the university. But now it's clearly clinical care. Those lines crossed some years ago. I don't remember exactly the year when they crossed, but call it, uh, you know, about the time I first became president. And, and those lines have departed. So the big risk is uncertainty about what the, how, basically how healthcare is going to get paid right. for, and what the model is for paying for healthcare. Many of us, the two of you especially, you, you know, you talk about this and I generally have the same view you guys do. Uh, you know, recognize our system is broken and it needs to be fixed and we need to move to something quite different from what we have now. How does that affect funds flowing from, in particular, the Yale New Haven uh, health system back to the medical school? Uh, and uh, how, does, how does that affect care delivered in a um, academic medical center context? We are more expensive in delivering that care, but we're delivering cutting edge care that is scientifically uh, based. And how do, we, how do we do that? Hopefully we can build it, you know, there are reserves in the system that could get us through short-term crises. And uh, if, if, um, 
uh, if revenue were to be uh, significantly uh, affected, uh, you know, negatively, uh, we, we would probably have to uh, build a new, a new model. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the model we have now uh, because it's working and working well. And I think we, I think we have the flexibility and ability to adapt to different models of healthcare reimbursement. Just since I have you, I'm going to give you a quick challenge on this. So I think that the model may be working on a financial basis, but if you look at the health of the people in the state of Connecticut and in the state and in the County of New Haven over the last 20 years, despite the fact that more money has flowed into the system every year above and beyond inflation, we have very little evidence of a return on that investment by our health system and our medical school on the actual health of people living in New Haven. If you look at life expectancy or you look at almost any other measure of health. So I also, I mean, this is, I think, I feel that we need a balanced scorecard that on one hand, we're able to, you manage the funds flow to be able to support an institution. That's definitely a checkbox. But, but are we clear that actually the end result of what we're producing is helping the world? By the way, the whole United, you could just say, well, okay, that's just New Haven. What about, we, we focus on the country. Okay, the country's life expectancy has gone down. All the health parameters have worsened over 20 years. Okay, no, but we're focusing on the world. Okay, the world's health parameters have gotten worse. So on our watch, by the way, this is Howie and me, and you know, we're, this is our fields. You know, we're here, so we have to take responsibility for it. But as a school, I also would like us to see this balanced scorecard where we can say to the trustees, you know, is there evidence of the end result of care writ large? And this is, gets to public health, I guess, you know, on a population level, are we actually making any, any progress? And, and instead, we're just raising money, spending more money and less, less return. Yeah, well, I, I don't disagree with that analysis. I mean, those are data and those data are, 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 are really quite self-evident. Uh, you did say something important, which I think is, uh, you can look at New Haven, but you could also look at the whole country, and it's the same thing, which suggests that this isn't something that Yale is causing, but rather something is broken in the whole system. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, what, what for the most part, as revenues come in, what do we spend them on? We spend them on research and clinical care, you know. So it, it, it's not it's not like we're expecting. Uh, funds to flow out of the medical school and somehow subsidize the rest of the university. Basically, what comes in in the medical school is spent by the medical school. And, you know, uh, uh, some years we have deficits and some years we have surpluses, but essentially it's a it's a balanced uh, it's a balanced budget. You know, uh, I think our obligations in the rest of the university are to do everything we can to keep central costs, administrative costs, overhead costs manageable so that as many of those dollars can go back directly to supporting additional research, to supporting great clinical care, and to educating medical students uh, and other kinds of students. Uh, uh, but um, the data aren't very good, uh, but, they, but I think that's because the whole system is, is not optimized. Let me just say one thing you can also, we can also think about, and that's kind of hovering behind here. You just cited data, and, I, and I, I'm data-driven. Howie, Harlan, you guys are data-driven. We need a system that is far more data-driven because when we do, we make better decisions. And COVID-19 pointed that out to us. You know, we went into COVID, into the pandemic. The first, even before the first cases of community transmission were noticed in Connecticut, two months before, actually. Um, and we said, uh, we were already meeting and saying, what do we need what do we need? What do we need to do? And uh, I put together a group. You, you know about this because you have great familiarity with it. Put together a group of essentially public health advisors and said, we're going to need to collect data and we're going to make our decisions based on, uh, on the data. We said, what are our goals? Our goals are to never have a big, giant outbreak on our campus. Another, it's another way of saying keep everybody healthy, as healthy as we can. To not be the vector of transmission with the community that surrounds us, because the community that surrounds us doesn't have the same resources and has other health stresses in their lives, housing, food, etc., poverty. And the third was not to overwhelm our hospital. 
right? That that was where remember flattening the curve and all of that, right? We, we right not overwhelm our hospitals so that truly sick people were being displaced by our students who are getting care for COVID. And we accomplished all of those goals because our public health modelers had great data collected from you know uh, traditional epidemiological sources to the virus and sewage coming, you know, that, that gave us very localized information about, you know, basically anybody, you know, anybody flushing a toilet in New Haven was contributing those data. And we knew where the, where all that data, were, from where it was flowing. Uh, we followed the data. And sometimes that meant being more aggressive, keeping people off our campus, doubling down on testing, having incredibly uh, a careful... Um, uh, uh, contact tracing and 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 uh, isolation, and sometimes it meant we could be more aggressive in letting people come back and in doing more of our educational program, right? Because the other part of what our goal was to keep our mission of research and education going during all this. And I think, you know, history will show that our campus result was not, you know, it was still a pandemic. People were quite sick but uh, was one of the better outcomes among university campuses. And, and it's because we followed, we followed data. And I think that's part of the solution for fixing medicine, right? Uh, go where the problems are instead of necessarily just where there are people who can afford uh, fancy care. Before we run out of time, I want to uh, ask you, you're the first president in a long while to have lived in the, quote, president's house of Yale University with your lovely wife, who's also a, a former public health professor here at Yale. Um, what informed your decision? And then would you recommend that the next president make that same decision? Because that is not an easy decision to make. Yeah, sure. It's an, it's an interesting one. A couple of uh, thoughts. You know, the president's house is an interesting arrangement. It's this huge mansion within which we have an apartment. And that apartment's up on the third floor, the top floor mostly. Uh, the second floor is space for guests. The first floor is all public event space. That's where their big, beautiful space is. Yes. And the ground floor, which is really like a walkout basement, that's where all the event staff have their offices. Right. So um, it's like living in an embassy yeah. where the ambassador has an apartment sitting on top of this big public space. Uh, I think that, that that setup probably works best for people whose children are either they don't have kids or the kids are out of the house. Uh, I think it's, it's, it might be a little hard for to raise kids in such a public environment, although our residential college heads do it with a kind of similar setup. I will say that um, we've really enjoyed living in the house and uh, uh, it makes hosting events really, really easy. We separate our lives, though, in the president's house from the university. So, for example, people are always shocked when they see me at the supermarket, often on first thing Saturday mornings, that's my shopping time. Don't you have someone who can shop for <laughs> No, no. And I think not, not only don't I have that, I don't want right. that. I want to live in the world. Uh, I will say, I do miss neighbors. And the house we own in New Haven uh, is near Edgerton Park. And uh, we know all our neighbors. We haven't lived there for 10 years. And we're looking forward to moving back in. We've had uh, family members house sitting there for us for a decade. And, uh, you know, I've, I've evicted the nephews and nieces, and um, now uh, we're fixing things up and uh, looking forward to living in a neighborhood again. Uh, neighborhood. What about your rec recommendation for the next president? Would you, would you tell him? Or her, Allie, or her. Or... Yeah, I would certainly say uh, live in the president's house and uh, enjoy being so close to campus. Get out for a walk with your dog in the evening. Yeah. Because uh, even on days when people aren't happy seeing you, they're always happy seeing your dog. <laughs> and uh, Portia and Mandy have both had that experience uh, uh, on campus. Um, and, uh, and of course, in, in times of campus emergency, it's good to be close to the action. Um, 
And I would say, you know, uh, I, you know, succession is an, it's an interesting moment for me. I have very mixed feelings about it. Cognitively, I, I know that um, bring, bringing someone in with new ideas is always important. Um, making a transition when the university is in good shape and we're in good shape financially with the endowment, with the budget. Uh, we have a great leadership team. We have great deans, including uh, 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 Megan Ranney. And, and uh, uh, really, the whole cabinet is very strong right now. Uh, you want to bring your success. It's time for succession in that sense. You want to bring a successor in who uh, uh, has wind at their back rather than at their, at their face. And I think uh, that makes the job much more attractive. Our campaign, which I will continue to work on right until we make our goal, uh, we hit a milestone. Uh, our, our goal is $7 billion. We have raised $5 billion as of the middle of summer. We're probably around 5.3 right now. And so that's going great. I'll continue working on it. And uh, personally, I I just would like to do a little more teaching and uh, a little more writing. That's great. Think about psychology. Think about uh, health, health and uh, uh, think about uh, leadership and policy and, uh, and and do a little bit of writing about them. But emotionally, it's hard to let go. Uh, at a more personal level, you know, I, I like to tell the story of Joe DiMaggio, who in his last year playing baseball for the Yankees, he was still batting 300. And uh, this sounds a little self-glorifying, and I don't mean to compare myself to, to Joe DiMaggio. But Joe DiMaggio, you know, when he announced his retirement and a little kid said, say it ain't so, Joe. And Joe said something like, it's important to step away when people don't want you to step away and don't wait around till everyone wants you to step away. I think there's some wisdom there. Well, I, I want to say, uh, I think it's wise what you're doing, but, but you are, yeah, you are indeed leaving at a time when, when people don't want you to leave. And that, that, that is for sure true. And your contributions have been immense. I'll put in one plug, you know, people listening should know that, you know, what a pioneer you were and are in the areas of emotional intelligence. But by, by the way, I think, you know, I always consider you a gifted investigator. Whenever you would give talks and sort of explain what your lab was doing and how you set up these experiments in sort of real world settings, I I was always sort of drawn to them. There's one you were telling us about on the beach one time where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, uh, so it's interesting. The lab did two things. uh, And uh, one of them was looking at the effects of emotion on thinking and behavior. And that got us into emotional intelligence. The idea of emotional intelligence really came from our lab and, uh, we published the first scientific paper on it. Uh, and uh, if you had asked me in 1990 when that paper came out, if 33 years, 34 years later, we'd still be talking about the idea, I would have said, no, no, it, you know, but, but here we are still talking about the idea. I'm glad it resonated. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the, the fact that the public was interested in it forced us to take it more seriously and really do a program of research over multiple decades uh, uh, around it. And then the health work, uh, although at the time we moved, uh, the, the health behavior work was really focused on, could we use principles from psychology to make messages more persuasive and then test whether those principles could work in the, you know, were robust enough, were strong enough to work in real field settings. So could we get people to buy sunscreen from a vendor at the beach? Yeah, I remember that story. People yeah. to go to the bodega in their neighborhood and buy a condom. Yeah. You know, and uh, we would set these very elaborate experiments up that would let us track behavior over long periods of time in response to multimedia campaigns based on psychological well, principles. They were so clever. I, I just, my plug for you is, getting back to the emotional intelligence things, I think that we should be, doubling down in the university about helping people to think about how they can acquire even better skills, not just our leaders, of course, leaders need that, but throughout the entire uh, university, because it's really that balance of, of other types of intelligence with the emotional intelligence leads to effectiveness in actually moving society forward. And, and I think that what, what you've done, you know, there's so much to do, but it's also how do we amplify this in different settings? How do we help people gain the kind of skills so that it's not that you were born a certain way, but you can actually build the skills to be able to be ever stronger in these areas. And anyway, that's my plug to you. I think there's a lot to be done, and and I hope you'll you'll do that. I'm so appreciative that you came on 
today uh, and uh, and appreciative for all your contributions over the year and your friendship, really. Thank you so much. Me too. For Me that. too. Well, thank you. Thank you both, uh, Harlan, Howie. You are, you are exemplars of the kinds of uh, professors that create a more unified Yale and a more innovative Yale. And then you are uh, uh, accessible as individuals, and you, I know you champion accessibility in terms of getting people uh, to Yale who might never have thought this was the kind of place they could be a part of. And uh, I'm really, really very grateful. It's, uh, it's what has made being president a true labor of love and uh, a true uh, honor. Uh, and uh, it fills me with humility when I think about uh, what a great institution this is. And so uh, thank you for all that you do. Thank you uh, very including much. Including hosting uh, a podcast. Thank you. <laughs> that, that, 100th that, that episode. Is this is Howie's brainchild. It's Howie's not, brainchild. it's Harlan's brainchild. But Harlan, take, take us home. Okay. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Kromholtz and Howie Foreman. And today with Peter Salovey. This has been a very special 100th episode, and we will be back at our regular time next week. But we always want to keep the conversation going. So please reach out via email at health.veritas at yale.edu to give us feedback or ask questions. Please rate us on Spotify, Google, or Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. And you can find us on social media, and increasingly we're trying to broaden our reach. But also, we're still on Twitter or X, where I'm at H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. That's H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. And I'm at the Howie. That's at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. Health and Veritas is produced with Yale School of Management and the Yale School of Public Health. Thanks to our researchers, these amazing students, Inez Gio and Sophia Stumpf. Peter, I hope I can introduce you to them one day. They are amazing. We've had really great students help support us on the podcast. And our producer, Miranda Schaefer, who's also just out of this world. And uh, Peter, you know... Our 100th episode, we wanted to have you on. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Talk to you soon, Howard. It's been a pleasure being with you, and uh, thanks so much. Congratulations on the 100th, uh, 100th episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.